Jesus Christ. Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew 5 44. That's a very different perspective and application of God's word, which I hold to now, than I would have uh, many years back while on active duty. So why even give this topic? Why is this relevant to our audience today? Well, first, my concern for my brethren's safety, uh, brothers, sisters, and their children, and things that I have seen firsthand related to unsafe firearm storage practices, one, and two, the lack of age and situation appropriate child weapon interactions. This topic touches us. This is one headline from 2015 from the Lancaster newspaper, Pennsylvania Amish man, age 21, shot dead by cousin, age 12. This also touches us. Now, many of my slides are going to relate to Michigan because I've prepared this talk and given it in Michigan, and we're from Michigan, so uh, some of the things here are going to be more Michigan-related, but I'm sure that the numbers would be similar in Indiana. But how well have Michigan hunters done on this area of firearm-related safety and injuries and death? In 1940, 35 were recorded dead and jumped up in 1960 to 307 and then dropped down in the 70s. And in, in, in the nine-year period from 2010 to 2018, only 16 dead, 86 injured. What changed? What made the difference? Well, in the state of Michigan, and as I imagine probably many states did, over a span of time, there were new mandatory hunter safety classes that were required to obtain a hunting license, be it for a firearm or bow, and we began to implement hunter orange laws. In other words, hunters going out into the field had to wear a certain percentage of their outer garment in a bright orange color to easily identify them and uh, mark them out in the field so that they would not be accidentally fired upon. Um, <clears throat> the leading causes of Michigan hunter fatalities and injuries in that nine-year period, of which there were 102, number one, careless handling of a firearm resulted or was responsible for 57% of those fatalities and injuries. Next would be the victim was not in sight. In other words, the firearm was discharged and hit someone that was not aimed at. And third, and probably equally as tragic, failure to properly identify the target. Unfortunately, almost half of these incidents were self-inflicted. I do want to assure everybody what this talk is not. It is not an appeal for gun control, neither will I be giving you a commercial for gun rights. Both of those are maybe more political topics, and that's not what we're here to discuss. We're here today to look into God's word and how that applies to us. And so we'll leave those topics for some other time. I am in no way going to be able to provide a comprehensive soup to nuts firearms safety course. I will only be just touching on some of the key or most fundamental things. And this is by no means a fault finding session. So if there is somebody here, and I don't know you, but if there's somebody here whose lives have been touched by um, an, an accident that has been firearm related or even a crime, uh, my heart goes out to you. I'm not here to point fingers at anyone, but I do hope that God's word will put a finger on or touch our thinking about the topics that we're going to look at and where necessary, bring about some thought felt change. So what is this discussion going to be now that we've said what it is not? This is going to be a humble, age-appropriate, respectful, and thought-provoking appeal 
for the safe use and storage of firearms, and I'm going to include all weapons in that, bows uh, included, as well as an appeal for God honoring firearm ownership choices. Now, what do I mean by humble, age appropriate, respectful, and thought provoking? Um, though I'm, I feel I'm qualified to give this talk, I am not a, uh, you know, a, a Michigan Department of Natural Resources uh, certified firearms instructor. Um, and so I want to approach this topic humbly. There may be those here in the audience that know more about this topic than I do, and I want to recognize that. Age appropriate, I will be not showing anything graphically here that would be uh, inappropriate for viewers of any age. So this is uh, a rated G presentation. Uh, respectful. Again, I want to be respectful uh, of those of my elders here and those that might have uh, more experience. And also, um, I do hope, though, to challenge you to think very carefully and biblically about the things that we're going to look at, particularly in the second half of the talk. So we might ask, why are you even giving a talk like this in a house of worship? Is this topic biblically relating to firearms? Where are you getting the biblically from? How, how is this something Christians should be gathered together in a worshipful setting talking about this? Well, in Deuteronomy, <clears throat> uh, Moses records, when thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement or a, a fence, a safety guard around the roof. Um, some of you may know that uh, in Israel at the time, uh, the roof Flat roof level was uh, also a dwelling place. People would go up there and, and maybe have a meal or they'd, they'd stay. And of course, nobody wanted to fall off the roof. So you did not want to bring blood upon thine own house if anybody fell off, okay? If we put this in uh, modern parlance, uh, I am my brother's keeper. But also I want to uh, maybe somewhat take this uh, prophecy from Ezekiel and take on also the role of the watchman. And here in Ezekiel 33, God says, the prophet says, If the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth he bloweth the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth and taketh not warning, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and he took no warning. But if the watchman see and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, his blood will I require of the watchman's hand." And so I stand before you here not as a, uh, as a type of Ezekiel or as a prophet, uh, but just as a brother in the Lord hoping to sound forth the trumpet of warning for some things that you may be doing that are not safe and may need some attention. So again, our outline, we're going to be looking at some fundamentals and then we're going to be looking at some choices that we make. So part one, back to basics. No matter the form... Firearms can be very useful tools, but these tools are designed and built for a singular purpose. Can anybody here in the audience maybe hazard a guess, if you really get down to the, to the bottom of it, what is the purpose of a firearm? What is it designed to do? Anybody? To kill, to take life, exactly. No matter the form, the singular purpose of a firearm is to kill. So can we as kingdom Christians safely even own or use firearms? And I would argue the answer to that is yes, if we appreciate the dangers and follow some sound guidelines or what I'm going to call fundamentals. Interestingly, these things that I'm going to share are the exact same fundamentals I learned as a 10-year-old boy from my father who learned them from the Marine Corps drill instructors in San Diego in 1960 and are still taught to this very day in Department of Natural Resource or similar hunter safety courses all across the country. That's one of the things that makes fundamentals the fundamentals. They never change. They've proven themselves to be the bedrock upon which, in this case, safe firearms handling is built. So the very first one of those we're going to address is that we never point a firearm at anyone or anything that we do not want to kill. Here's an example of a violation of rule number one. In November 2010 in Allegan County, again, all of these references are going to be to Michigan incidences, a 59-year-old deer hunter was involved. The victim climbed a ladder tree stand with a loaded firearm on a bungee cord, pulled up on the firearm, catching the trigger, causing the discharge of the firearm, and the round went right through the victim's wrist and face. The outcome, death, self-inflicted wound. So it doesn't necessarily mean that 
in this case, he was intentionally aiming the weapon at himself, but because of his unsafe practice, bringing the weapon up into the deer stand, the firearm was pointed at him. It was pointed at something he did not want to kill, and unfortunately, the outcome was tragic. Second basic fundamental, since firearms are designed to kill, we should treat every firearm as if it is loaded, even when we know it is not. In fact, it is said that the most dangerous weapon or firearm is the one that the handler knows is unloaded. Third, keep appropriate safeties on and fingers outside of the trigger guard until you are ready to fire the weapon. There's no reason to have the safety off or your finger within the trigger guard when, for example, just walking through uh, a corn stubble field on a pheasant hunt, as an example, or walking through a woods to your tree blind or to your ground stand on a deer hunt. So here's an example of a violation of rule number three in October 2010 in Lenawee County. Uh, that's where our home church is located. A 14-year-old squirrel hunter uh, was involved here. The shooter crossed over a downed tree with his shot, when his shotgun discharged, striking the shooter in the lower abdomen. The outcome was self-inflicted death. Here's another example of the violation of rule number three, November 2017 in Roscommon County. 32-year-old deer hunter involved here. The victim fell asleep in a blind with a pistol in his hand. He was awakened when his cell phone rang. Startled, he squeezed the trigger of his handgun and shot himself in the leg. Outcome, self-inflicted injury. He did survive this one. Fundamental number four, always be certain of your target and what is ahead of and behind it. Hunters bear the responsibility for always positively identifying their target as a legal game animal. Now this little hand puppet, it's actually a chalk drawing, but it's supposed to resemble a hand puppet with the, with the light there behind it. Of course, when we look at the, uh, the shadow, uh, we see the outline of what appears to be a deer with some antlers here. And the point of this graphic is, is that things are not always what they appear to be. Here is a violation of Rule 4, what I'm calling 4.1. November of 2011 in Iron County, a 35-year-old deer hunter, the shooter fired at a white patch in thick cover, believing it to be a wounded deer. The round struck the victim through the arm and chest. The outcome was death. The victim was misidentified as a whitetail deer. Never needed to happen. Here's another one in September of 2012, St. Clair County, a 24-year-old coyote hunter. Shooter watched what he believed was a raccoon 181 yards away at the base of a tree. Why he was going to shoot at a raccoon 180 yards away, I have no idea. Nonetheless, he fired one shot and struck a victim in the head. Outcome, death. Victim misidentified as a raccoon. And another. May of 2015 in Crawford County, this time a 39-year-old turkey hunter and the victim a 59-year-old turkey hunter. The shooter mistakenly took the victim's movements and turkey call for a real turkey. The shooter shot at the sound at the victim, striking him in the leg, abdomen, and hand. Outcome, multiple injuries, misidentified nearby hunter as a turkey. And another, this is the last of these. Really just driving home this point of how important it is to positively identify the target. November of 2018 in Antrim County, 47-year-old deer hunter, the shooter heard a noise and saw a deer bedded along a ridge, which looked like it was about ready to get up. So the shooter, quote, just reacted and fired. While field dressing a deer, the 38-year-old victim was struck by the 47-year-old hunter's round entering through the right rear and into the gut of the victim. Outcome, death. Hunter misidentified as a deer. <clears throat> a couple of other lighthearted photos here, what I'll call fundamental 4.2, and that is always knowing what is behind or beyond your target. So first we want to positively identify the target. I don't think that we have any problem at all identifying that this is a white-tailed deer in the front yard of this residential homestead, 
And this is a very nice mule deer here. And here we have a pair of squirrels playing tag on uh, the trunk of this tree. Now, I know nobody of the hunters here in this room would ever take this shot or this one, but might you take this one? November of 2016 in Branch County, 18-year-old deer hunter. The shooter fired at a deer and missed, and the projectile entered an enclosed blind further down range, striking a 71-year-old hunter in the chest. The outcome was death. The victim was out of sight of the shooter within the line of fire. He took a shot and was not aware of what was downrange from his intended line of fire. February 2017, Oceana County, 62-year-old squirrel hunter. The shooter shot at a squirrel in a tree near the victim, and the projectile ricocheted off of the tree trunk and struck a 13-year-old victim in the head, resulting in the 13-year-old's death. This is serious stuff. <clears throat> Here are some examples that affect the Plain uh, community. Uh, this uh, was reported out of Cleveland. Stray bullet hits plowing Amish boy in the head. Um, four days later, same incident. Man says he may have shot Amish teen. Uh, the story goes this man was using a rifle to shoot at doves in the air. Um, not a good idea. Again, those who are hunters here know you do not use a rifle to shoot at birds. A shotgun would be the more appropriate choice. And in this case, that round, I believe it was a 22 caliber rifle, that can travel up to a mile and uh, non-fatally, fortunately, hit this Amish boy way, way, way down range while he was in a field plowing. This incident here in Indiana did not quite turn out the same way. Amish man accidentally kills girl in horse-drawn buggy with a stray gunshot, and this headline said he would serve 30 days in jail. Um, I'm sorry, I thought this was in Indiana, it was in Ohio. Ohio freak death, man fires gun into the air, bullet travels over a mile and kills 15-year-old Amish girl. We always need to know what is not only the target, but what is downrange or beyond the target to safely use firearms. Fundamental number five, firearms not in use should be unloaded and properly locked and or stored. And only the appropriate ammunition for a particular firearm should be used. I realize this might be a little bit of a technical point, and it's probably most relevant to those who use uh, 22 caliber rifles. But uh, the 22 caliber comes in multiple different varieties. In some cases, there are some rifles that are capable of firing both the 22 short, long, and long rifle cartridge. Others are specific only to the 22 long rifle, and also not to be confused with the 22 Magnum. So you cannot mix and match unless the rifle is specifically chambered to be able to accommodate that. The bottom line, don't try to use inappropriate in, uh, ammunition in the wrong uh, firearm. And similarly, only ammunition should be fired in a firearm. A man was charged with aggravated manslaughter after a practical joke went bad and turned deadly. He fired a muzzle loader rifle with cigarette butts and paper towel wadding aimed at his friend's chest and fired. Three cigarette butts penetrated the rib cage of the victim just above the heart, and he was pronounced dead at the scene. Uh, alcohol was involved in this incident. It was an overnight party, so clearly there was a um, failure in judgment here. But the point being, it doesn't matter what is put into a firearm, the outcome can still be deadly, even if it's just cigarette butts and paper towel. This is directed maybe more towards the children amongst us here, but it is never appropriate to try to explode ammunition on its own. In other words, shells are intended to be fired within a rifle or shotgun or handgun only, and that is the only place where they may safely be discharged. Do not attempt to discharge ammunition using, for example, a hammer or squeezing it in a vise or anything else like that. The outcome could be tragic. 
what happens is, is that the powder could explode and send bits and pieces of the shell casing off in various directions at a high rate of speed with a lot of energy. We call that shrapnel, and that could be very dangerous. Unless we think that this is only a thing that we need to be concerned about with seven-year-old boys, even trained people in the Army seem to not get this message. This is an actual uh, Army weapon safety message. I believe the 1002 means October of 02 from Afghanistan. Um, a recent uh, 50 caliber machine gun incident um, involved a, a man taking a 50 caliber, that, that means it's a half of an inch across shell, uh, round and using it as a hammer to um, beat a, uh, a metal, uh, metal bolt between a couple of pieces of something he was trying to put together to secure his, his machine gun, I think to his Humvee, and it went off in his hand. Um, I, I saw the photograph of this, there's no way that I could show it to you. Uh, but this man will never use his, his hand again. So some of us might think, well, you know, this is interesting information, but this doesn't apply to me. We don't have any shotguns, rifles, or handguns in our home. Uh, but, you know, uh, our son or maybe even daughter has a BB gun or a pellet gun. Certainly those are safe, right? There's nothing at all that we need to worry about with, with BB guns or pellet guns. I, I want to assure you that BB guns and pellet guns are not toys. Uh, even if they're pink with camouflage. Uh, um, this, uh, these are BBs. For those that don't know, uh, BBs are little, small, round uh, things, and, and pellets are uh, shaped a little bit more in kind of like a bullet shape. Um, so uh, you use one or the other. Mother of two dies after being shot with a BB gun. This was in California. Uh, this lady was uh, fired upon by a boyfriend who claimed that it was an accident, but nonetheless, she died. Boy, age 10, dies after his brother accidentally shoots him in the head with a BB gun at close range. I've blanked out the names here. This was in March of 2013. Uh, down in Florida, 13-year-old boy uh, and his, his brother were shooting targets with a newly purchased uh, BB gun outside their home in Florida, and the brother pointed the gun uh, at the other from six inches away. And uh, this has been shot a pellet, so it's not clear to me whether or not it really was a BB gun or a pellet gun. Nonetheless, uh, hit him above the right ear, penetrated his skull. Uh, the young boy dropped uh, to the ground and, and died. Um, BB guns and pellet guns injure about 21,000 Americans annually. That's a lot of people. And the average is about four fatalities per year as the result of these uh, BB gun and pellet gun injuries. From the time period 1990 to 2000, there were 39 such fatalities, and 32 of these involved children that were less than 15 years old, leading the Consumer Product Safety Commission, CPSC, to issue a safety alert that BB guns can kill. So if you're a parent and you have a BB gun or a pellet gun in your home, um, they need to be treated with the same level of respect that you would a rifle or a shotgun and not allow young, especially unsupervised use of those, I'm going to call them weapons. That's what they are. So I've just touched on something, unsupervised use or unsupervised access. Let's talk a little bit about children and unsecured firearms. Unsecured firearms in the hands of children are often a deadly combination. Eight-year-old Amish boy shot in chest while brother played with gun. Five-year-old looking for candy found a gun instead, probably a handgun, then fatally shot his seven-year-old brother. And here are seven more. I'll go ahead and read them. Boy seven accidentally kills five-year-old sister with grandfather's gun. Four-year-old girl shot in the head by two-year-old brother during accidental shooting in Lebanon County. Florida boy, eight, accidentally kills sister, age five, and wounds neighbor, age four, in gun horror. Five-year-old Kentucky boy fatally shoots two-year-old sister. Six-year-old girl killed by brother in accidental shooting. Thirteen-year-old accidentally shoots 11-year-old brother in the head. And, and like I said, this is just, you know, a half a dozen or so. In researching for this talk, these types of headlines were not difficult to find at all. There are many cases of young people unintentionally causing harm or death to other young people through access, unsupervised, to weapons. 
It is estimated that there are about four and a half million American children living in a home with at least one loaded and unsecured firearm present. And uh, since 2015, up until I believe it was 2018 or 2019, I think, well, when I got the statistics here, uh, there were at least 1,062 such incidences resulting in 644 injuries and 418 deaths. These child shootings and this, these statistics here, these are not murders, accidental homicides, or suicides. This number is just child-on-child -child accidental shootings. The important thing to keep in mind, too, is that uh, even if you don't, your neighbor does. What do I mean by that? Even if you don't have unsecured firearms in your home, there is a potential that a neighbor does. Children are curious by nature, and they're going to explore, and even if they're told not to, they often will play with firearms, even pulling the trigger. They don't understand the consequences of life and death, and that this thing can kill. There are too many negligent shooting deaths, and it's res the responsibility of gun owners to educate their children and properly secure their weapons and possibly even making sure that our children know appropriately how to respond in those situations where they may come across a firearm. So I didn't get this anywhere official. This is just, in my mind, common sense. A child should be taught to stop what they're doing, and if there are any other children around, move them and any other children away from the area where the gun is and tell them not to touch it, and then go find an adult who can come and take care of that weapon. It would not be appropriate for the child to pick the weapon up and take it to the adult. They should leave it where it is and have the responsible adult come to the scene and secure that weapon. So how do we secure weapons? Safekeeping is very, very important, and all firearms should be kept out of reach of children and other irresponsible persons, those who may not have the mental capacity to understand the danger there by locking them. And there are a couple of different styles of trigger locks. Uh, some go through as a, as with a key, uh, locking the trigger in place. Um, here's an example of that. Others can be cables that go through uh, the chamber and through the magazine and so forth. There's no way that this firearm can be uh, discharged. As well, the appropriate safes should be employed or locking gun cases. So um, here you can see a, a full-size safe. There are handguns at the top, the ammunition, other valuables like a camera. We've got the long guns here. This is a combination locked safe with four bolts in the door. Here we have a locking individual gun case. And here's another approach. You can see uh, a very strong and sturdy uh, lock securing this bar in place. There's no way that none of these long guns is going to be able to be removed from off of that wall. Now here are some examples of unsafe keeping. So here we have uh, three long guns just in a wooden rack. Uh, might look nice, ammunition's probably down here in this drawer, it's on the wall. Anybody can break into this home, children can climb up onto a, a step stool or a chair and gain access to these uh, weapons here uh, with, with nothing impeding them. Uh, here we have, uh, this is, uh, these are staged photos uh, from our home here. Uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but uh, you're probably aware of people who store, uh, in this case, this is a, a shotgun uh, behind a little cabinet right by the back door to the backyard. Because, well, we just never know when a coyote is going to run across the backyard, and we need to be able to grab our shotgun immediately and kill it, right? Um, here's a shotgun underneath a bed. Uh, we just don't know who's going to break into the home or behind a bedroom door. Um, if, if I, as a homeowner, can get to this easily, so can my child, or so could an intruder. So these are examples of unsafe keeping. It is our responsibility as firearms owners. If we own it, we need to respect it, and we need to secure it. And if you are not of the financial means, or you know somebody that's not of the financial means to be able to even purchase an inexpensive lock, law enforcement agencies all across the country will give them to you for free. So let's shift gears a little bit from the safety side, and we're going to talk a little bit more now for some things specifically responsible to Bible-believing kingdom Christians and some of the choices that, um, that we have uh, before us um, as, as 
we apply, seek to apply God's word, um, and, and as the title says, relate biblically to firearms. So we, we talked about how these are not toys, and, and to games, toys, and play are a wonderful thing for our children. Um, the toys that we give to our children are, are wonderful tools to help them to learn how to relate to the world around them, and they can teach important lessons. Um, I would imagine that just about every woman or girl in my, uh, my hearing here has at one point had at least one baby doll. And, and doesn't it bring a smile to our faces, whether we're a, a daddy or a mommy, uh, to see our little girls taking care of baby, giving baby doll a bath, putting the diapers on, a little nightshirt, whatever the case might be, or playing house with uh, you know, little figurines. Um, you know, boys can uh, have their own little farm, and, and when they get older, maybe a little motorized John Deere and, and take the dog around the farm. There's a proverb that sort of applies to this, right? So Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I understand that this primarily applies to the spiritual upbringing of our children, but I would give us the argument, or set the argument before us, that the way that we as parents equip our children through their toy chest also can uh, instill lessons to them. So what sort, of you think, what sort of lessons do you think this boy is learning with this toy? Okay, uh, A pretty stark difference from baby dolls and uh, toy chickens to this. Okay, What is this toy teaching? How is this child being trained up? And what do these toys teach to their user? As parents, isn't it our responsibility to make thoughtful choices about the toys that our children have access to and the type of play that they're going to engage in. What lessons do children's toys teach them? And in this case, here, this is a photograph from an Air Force base, right, uh, Air Force base, right Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, where we have a scout who's being handed a plastic M16 replica uh, for a, a, a training exercise. Uh, this gentleman here fully well knows what an M16 is for, what is he teaching this person? Now, let's be honest here. How many of us, uh, I'll just limit this to, the, to the, the men's side of the, the church. How many of us have young boys, as young boys, ever did this? Okay. So do we need to panic if we see our five or six-year-old boy doing something like this? Or maybe he finds a stick someplace out in the woods, or he's crafty with a saw and and a, and a, and a you know, old piece of two-by-four or something like that. No, I don't think that we need to panic. It's a teachable moment. It's one just like any other opportunity for us to be able to teach our children at even a young age about Jesus' teachings about loving our neighbor. Is it appropriate maybe to use a gun to provide for our family and put food in the freezer? Yes. Is it appropriate for me to chase my sister around the house going bang, bang, bang that I'm going to kill her? No, that's not appropriate. It's a teachable moment. I think that this story might be true. I'm going to take it at face value. I got it from a book on the topic of firearm safety in, in America. The story goes like this. When little Robbie's daddy would come home from work, they enjoyed playing this game of bang, bang, you're dead with a finger pistol. And Robbie's daddy would dramatically fall down, pretending to be shot, and he'd rise up and they'd laugh together. And it was wonderful fun until one day... Robbie found his daddy's loaded handgun, and as in the past, he greeted his daddy with bang, bang, you're dead, and he pulled the trigger. This time, daddy did not get up, and there was no laughter because Robbie's father was dead. So play prepares children for life. What are the lessons that we are teaching our children? Next topic, a matter of style, the militarization of our hunting guns, or don't judge me by the clothes I wear, you don't know my heart. Here is an example of two identical rifles in terms of all the mechanicals, caliber, same manufacturer, everything. I'm not going to give the name or the caliber here. Same rifle wearing different clothes. As plain people, if we feel that we need one of these hunting rifles, which one should we own? 1 Thessalonians 5, and 23 say that we are to abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Which one of these carries with it an appearance of evil? <clears throat> these are uh, real, current, 
modern military um, rifles based on the, the basic M16A2 platform. And this is a hunting rifle, as is this and this. I can tell the difference. Can you? What culture do we want to be identified with? The military, citizen militias, and law enforcement? Or the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace? Military-styled firearms communicate a message. They have a reputation, and they have associations. They identify their owner with a particular culture, whether or not the purchaser intended that or not. And so my thought-provoking question for us on this is, should plain people with a non-resistant testimony own militarized versions of firearms? Topic number three, handguns. Um, my wife and I received an interesting wedding gift uh, from a well-meaning cousin, uh, a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Um, he, knowing my military background, and, and he had two brothers that served in the Army, apparently felt that it would be important for us to have this very valuable self-defense home protection weapon as a wedding gift. Um, we subsequently sold it. But on handguns, um, a survey was done to look at the leading uses or utilizers of handguns. And the first two are probably not surprising, right? We would expect law enforcement and then the military are going to very heavily use handguns but the third most common reason for somebody to have or utilize handguns is personal protection, self-defense. And then further on down the list, hunting, survival, uh, protection on camping trips, hiking trips from dangerous animals. You know, I'm out in the Rocky Mountains on a hike, and maybe I want to have a sidearm with me in case, uh, you know, a bear comes or something like that. And then we have competitive shooting and then recreational uh, shooting. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of a gun, and then specifically how that relates to handguns, okay? So we discussed that the purpose of a gun, at the beginning of the talk, of a firearm, is to kill, it's to take life. And handguns are specifically designed, if we're really honest about it, to kill people. Uh, that, that's the purpose behind their design. They're portable, they're concealable, they're easy to use. Some people may say, well, I feel I need to have this handgun with me at all times or have a handgun with me for self-protection. But guns are not necessarily to protect me. They are to kill you, right? Unless there's any confusion on this part, let's see how some handgun manufacturers have presented their handguns, and I think we'll be able to at least settle the case, at least if we look back in time. I'm not going to verbalize the uh, name of the manufacturer here, but uh, you can read this. And uh, look at this picture. We've got a nice family scene here. Here's dad. Mom's sitting on the sofa or chair. She's got a book in her lap. Son here at her side. There's a couple of daughters. Little boy here on, on daddy's back. Wonderful family scene over the backdrop of this revolver here. Isn't this interesting? Uh, see your dealer and have him explain in detail all the safety features of this uh, firearm here. But Paul says in Romans chapter 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Here's another one. A very fascinating uh, cell line here between man and man at the last there is Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit no one law the law of self-defense and it's very easy to tell from this photograph here who the good guy is self-respecting businessman nice clean cut and we've got this very angry faced fellow over here and between the two of them the inference is this fellow needs this to protect him from this one over here but Jesus said that we resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, Matthew 5, 39. 
And here's, uh, here's one here, uh, specifically uh, much more modern. If we want to discount the first two as, yeah, well, that's, that was the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. Now I lay me down to sleep beside my bed, a kimber I keep. Should I awake and find you inside, the coroner's van is your next ride. There's no mistake whatsoever at all what the intent is of this poem associated with this handgun. Romans 12, 17 through 19, though, says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repayeth, saith the Lord. The fourth topic we're going to look at here is where is your treasure? Here are some interesting things for us to think about with relationship to where we might want to put our money. A trophy elk resort in Colorado charges between $6,500 and $12,500 for one bull elk hunt. The cost depends on how big the, uh, the rack is on the elk that you shoot. For $6,000, you can go hunt a cougar in Montana. If uh, moose is more your, more your style, you can go to Idaho on a moose hunt for 6000 And I had to laugh when I saw this one. A Michigan trophy whitetail deer hunt, $5,500 to $8,000. Why would somebody in Michigan pay $5,500 to go do something that they could go do on a neighboring farm? I have no idea. When I drive past some of the, uh, the places in our area that have the buck poles up on opening day, None of those guys had to spend $5,500 or to $8,000 to have somebody take them out to the woods to find some of the deer that they did. But the challenging question for us is, where is our treasure? And Jesus said in Matthew 6 that we are not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. Well, let's take a look at some of these treasures. Uh, there's that successful elk hunt. And this young lady here, she got herself her cougar. And this fellow in Idaho got his moose. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's this fellow's treasure? Uh, I lost count at about 15. And there's more off to the side. I cropped the picture down. Now, this next slide might sting just a little bit, but hear me out. What is my aim? Pun intended. Is it to feed my family? The dough will serve that purpose just fine. Or to feed my ego? Which one was this fellow more interested in? And what spirit are we manifesting when we associate ourselves with the hunting culture? And this can get real personal. Again, I don't know any of you, so I'm not poking any fingers. But I think that we need to really carefully examine the influence that the hunting culture has had on us. <clears throat> Casual wear. In this case, we've got a pink fleece windbreaker, I guess you could say, with camouflage over the shoulders and the arms. Uh, did you know that you can do a complete wedding in camouflage? Yes, including the bride's dress. Um, we don't do this out of a spirit of humility. Can we, can we agree? Uh, I think this fellow is here either storing all the firearms for his entire neighborhood or he just doesn't know what to do with his money. <laughs> I hope that there are no trucks in the parking lot like this one. A call to action. The call to action is this. To safely handle, operate, and store firearms. To supervise all child weapon interactions. And that includes bows, by the way. Let me pause for a minute. I've seen this. Church service is over. You receive an invitation to go to a brother and sister's house for dinner or supper. There are a lot of young children. Adults are busy talking over coffee and cookies. The children, of course, 
two minutes after their plates are cleared, want to go play. And the next minute, you look out the window, and there's your child with a couple of their children with a bow shooting at birds off the bird feeder. Not an adult anywhere in sight. And of course, permission was not requested nor granted. That's what I mean when I say unsupervised child weapon interactions, okay? If there was an adult there to provide guidance and so forth, that might be appropriate, though I'm a bird watcher, so I don't necessarily agree with shooting, shooting birds off bird feeders, unless they're house sparrows. <clears throat> uh, and we want to make kingdom-wise choices, and there are maybe many other areas, but I just picked the four, and that is the idea that children's play prepares them for life and that guns are not toys and we need to really make sure that we're not encouraging our children in that direction their play needs to be kingdom oriented right the family is the training ground for the kingdom of god should we really be purchasing militarized firearms for hunting or does it really look like i'm ready to join the michigan militia do handguns honestly have a place in the plain home that's that's a deep thought-searching question that we really need to consider. And when we hunt, are we hunting for trophy or are we hunting to provide for our family? I thank you very much for your time and would be happy to open up to any questions that you might have. And feel free, it doesn't have to just focus on the specific subject area if you have any other Questions about our, our family, background, past, journey, anything, I'm, I'm, I'm wide open. What brought you to Kansas Park? So um, my, uh, my family, my wife and I specifically, have had a, a fascinating journey. <clears throat> I was raised as a Roman Catholic, my wife as a Lutheran. And uh, my father, as you saw, was a Vietnam-era Marine, so I grew up in a very uh, uh, pro-American uh, home. Um, you might say it was almost a foregone conclusion that I was going to go into the military. It was something I very much desired to do. And uh, 